God bless you. This is Apostle Winston Cooper. I want to empower you to move deeper in the prophetic. Listen, if you're called to be a prophet, if you are, are a prophetess, if you are uh, someone that feels that God has called you to prophesy and to operate in the office of the prophet in this generation, this training will help you. It will empower you to go deeper into understanding how prophets operated. Um, I want to share some things with you from my book, Biblical Prophetic Theology. Biblical Prophetic Theology. This is a very powerful book that you do want to put in your library. It will be a contribution to the rest of the references that you have in your library. This is such a time that we need prophets and prophetesses to emerge and prophesy the Word of God. Not prophesy their opinion, not prophesy their theology, but prophesy the Word of God. Um, this is a day where many people who are who many people are professing their prophets. They are professing their prophecies. They are professing they are the mouthpiece of God. But when you hear their word, their word is incongruent to the biblical model. It is incongruent to the prophetic spirit discovered in the word of God. Listen, if we do not have a standard, if we do not have a canonicity to test prophets, then we are in trouble. And so what gave me the unction to write this book, Biblical Prophetic Theology, is that I have been seeing a lot of prophets and prophetesses arising and their word is incongruent or their word is misinterpreting the authors of the Bible. And so I, I began to move and take a, I took a journey. I went and looked at how the prophets operated from the book of Genesis all the way down to the book of Malachi. Now in my uh, uh, Biblical Prophetic Theology Volume 2, I'm going to deal with how the New Testament prophets operated. But when we look at how the prophets operated in the Old Testament, there are some things that we can learn from these prophets. There's some things we can glean from them. And the prophetic spirit is still in operation to those who are open for it. I've seen prophets who came out and they was authentic. They came out and they prophesied the word of the Lord according to scripture. And now we're living in a day and time, sad to say, we're living in a day and time now where so-called prophets are moving away from scripture. They're moving away from special revelation and moving into their own revelation. But there's some things I'm going to share with you from 1 Kings. I gave you a couple of principles in 1 Kings in session one. But today I'm going to share some more things found from the prophets in 1 Kings today. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 5, there, there's a principle that I discovered and highlighted from this passage of scripture. It deals with a man of God. Remember we told you before, Ish Ha Elohim was another term for a prophet, a man of God. And so in verse 1 it says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now, Jeroboam was a king at this particular time. He was a king that decided to create two golden calves. And not only did he create two golden calves to remind the people of the time of Exodus when Aaron created the, calf, the golden calf, but he also established an altar there where these two golden cows were, uh, were, was, was established as a place of worship in Bethel. Now listen, it was Bethel, when you look at it from an etymological root word, you see the word Beth, which is the Hebrew word for house. El is the root word for God, might, strength. So Bethel literally means the house of God. So right in this particular location, the king named Jeroboam, he decided to build two golden calves with an altar there to get people to worship in Israel instead of going down to Jerusalem or what we say in the Hebrew, Yerushalayim. As he created this altar, this was a spiritual place to do spiritual work. He had the people, or he compelled the people to stay in this location to worship. Now remember, there was, a, there was commanded by Moses to go to Jerusalem three times a, a year. And so God sends a man of God. He sends a prophet to Jeroboam to rebuke him, to break down this altar. Now, this altar, now, first of all, I want to share something with you before I deal with this principle. Altars that are um, created for 
idolatry. They are created for idol attraction. God will always raise a prophet to break down idolatrous altars. And so here in this text, in verse 13, or verse two, in chapter 13, verse 2, the man of God cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, the Hebrew word, misbeach. He speaks to the altar. Thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who, who burnt incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. The prophet further says this in verse 3 of 1 Kings 13. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the sin of the man of God, cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, shrunk, then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So what is the principle found in 1 Kings 13, verse 1 to 5? What is the principle found in this pericope? Here's what I wrote. God will raise up a prophet, the man of God, to speak to wicked altars and break them apart. Prophets need to understand the technology of altars. Whenever there is a wicked altar set or established in a location, it can open a door for demons to enter. An altar is a door for demonic entry or angelic entry. And so the altar is a highway for demons to flow, or it can be a highway if it's a righteous altar for angelic entities to flow. And so wherever there's an altar, if that altar is identified as wicked, it's going to attract wicked powers. And so this wicked altar was something that God never established. And whenever there's a wicked altar, God will raise up a righteous prophet to tear down wicked altars. Wicked altars create wicked patterns. Wicked altars create wicked thoughts. Wicked altars create wicked behaviors. And so God will raise you up as a righteous prophet to tear down wicked altars in your family, to tear down wicked altars in your city. Whenever there is a wherever, wherever there's a wicked altar established, you will, you as a prophet should feel an unction, a burden, to prophesy to it. Notice that in First Kings chapter thirteen, that the man of God prophesied to the altar, and it is time now for prophets to rise up and prophesy against wicked altars that are promoting drugs, that are sponsoring sex trafficking, that is, that is sponsoring human trafficking that is sponsoring false doctrine. This man of God was authorized, prophetically licensed by God to speak to wicked altars. Now I want to share something with you. You have to be prophetically licensed by God. You have to have a true anointing to speak to wicked altars. Because if you are not licensed by God to speak to wicked altars, the altar that you prophesy against can fight against you. It's important that you get into prayer that you hear with clarity what God is trying to tell you to prophesy to or prophesy against. When you do that, you can easily break down wicked altars, which create strong goals, strong men hide behind strong coats. Now that is a very powerful uh, principle there. Now listen, in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 6, listen, with, uh, this, listen to the next principle. In verse 6 of chapter 13, Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Remember when Jeroboam stretched out his hand against the man of God for him to be arrested, the Holy Spirit withered his hand. And so he had to ask the man of God, he had to ask the prophet of God, pray that my hand will be restored. Now notice, here's the principle in 1 Kings 13, 6. God will not heal or restore some unless they find a prophet to intercede for them. 
Sometimes God does not heal people or restore their health back until they find a prophet. When King Abimelech in Genesis, I believe, Abraham, no, Abraham, because of fear, gave King Abimelech his wife. And as Abimelech was about to go into Sarah, God spoke to King Abimelech in a dream. And God said, listen, this woman here is the wife of a prophet. God began to rebuke King Abimelech. I believe his name is King Abimelech. He began to rebuke him. And King Abimelech was ignorant that this woman was married to Abraham. Or what we say in Hebrew, Abraham. And so he began to tell God, okay, I would not go into her. But watch what God says. He says, I'm going to put a sickness on you. Now you need to ask Abraham to pray to heal you. There, there's some healings that will not happen with your prayer. There's some healings that will not happen for the people based upon their prayer, should I say, that you might be a prophet, a prophetess. There are some restorations that will not happen until a people or, or an individual finds a prophet or a prophetess of God. This King Jeroboam understood that he could not heal himself by his own prayer because he was drowning in wickedness. He had to pray. He had to ask the man of God, please pray for me, intercede for me, that God will restore my hand back. It was only when the Ish HaElohim, the man of God, the Navi, the Navi, the oracle, the mouthpiece of God, it was only when the, of God, the man of God or the prophet of God spoke healing, spoke restoration for Jeroboam, that he was restored. So some people, they, they're not receiving their healing because they have not found, they have not located a prophet, a prophet or prophetess. Now listen, 1 Kings 13, verse 8 to 10, there's another principle. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Now watch this. King Jeroboam, when he, once he was healed, he was trying to invite the prophet to come eat with him. But God had already instructed the prophet, don't eat in this place. Don't even sit down. Don't take a rest in this place. I need you to prophesy, fulfill your assignment, and go home. And prophets, you have to listen to the instructions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sometimes will tell you to go into a particular location, uh, uh, utilize or actualize a prophetic ministry, and don't rest there. Don't eat there. That was no. That was those instructions that was given to this man of God. But Jeroboam would try to get him to eat there. And so the man of God said, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. I'm going to stop right there. Sometimes prophets get sick. Sometimes prophetesses get sick because they're eating in the wrong location. They are resting in the wrong location. There are some churches they are assigned to minister and lead and not fellowship with. It might seem cruel. It might seem it might seem seem rude, but you have to obey the voice of God more than anything. And so he disregarded. But watch this: in 1 Kings thirteen verse eighteen, there was a, there was an old prophet that met the young prophet. This prophet was a young prophet. And the old prophet, not King Jeroboam, but the old prophet, again, asked the man of God, come eat with me. I want you to stay with me because God told me to tell you to stay with me. And because the young prophet did not have you no know, strong discernment, and because the young prophet wanted to honor the old prophet, he ended up staying with the old prophet while they were eating. The old prophet then hears the real word of God. At first, the old prophet was lying to the young prophet. But while they were eating and fellowshipping, the true word of God came to the old prophet, and the old prophet prophesied doom on the young prophet. And we see this in verse 18. Um, 1 Kings 13, 18 says, He said to him, the old prophet said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And the angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. 
So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they sat at the table, verse 20, 1 Kings 13, verse 20, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord had said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Listen to me. There are some old prophets who have deviated from the proper prophetic path. There are some old prophets that you might want to respect because they got celebrity status. But I don't care if an old prophet is trying to get you to follow their model or paradigm. If God says, don't follow that paradigm, don't follow that model, obey God. Obey God. This young prophet did not obey obey God because he honored the he honored the old prophet's word more than the word of God that was spoken to him before he met the old prophet. He got out of his lane. He missed his prophetic timing, and judgment occurred against his man. See, there are things that God will tell you as a prophet. There are certain instructions that God will give you as a prophet. There will be a certain message that God will give you as a prophet or prophetess. Don't deviate from that message. Don't deviate from that truth. That message is what's, it is what's making you a prophet. That message is what's making you a prophetess. Do not let any other prophet or prophetess who has a different message cause you to move away from the message God has given you. You have to be certain as a prophet with the oracle that God has given you. You have to make your face, like God told Ezekiel, you have to make your face like an adamant stone, like flint. You have to continue on obeying God's instruction, meeting, networking, uh, um, talking, dialoguing with the ones that God wants you to talk to. If you do that, you will succeed as a prophet. You will endure as a prophet. Your prophetic ministry will not be cut short because you know how to distinguish the voice of God from the voice of the rest. God bless you. This is Apostle Winston Cooper. I will be back with more. I want to encourage you to get this book, Biblical Prophetic Theology. I have over 100 prophetic principles in this book that's exegetical, that's no, that is powerful, insightful from scripture. It, it, I'm going to share this before I close. It's one thing to read the scripture, it's another thing to explain the scripture. We have a lot of people reading the scripture, but they're not explaining the scripture. If you want to get true, authentic prophetic principles from the word of God, you have to learn how to explain the scripture. This is Apostle Winston Cooper. I will be back later on. God bless you.